Section Two of Modern Russian Poetry, an Anthology, selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Yevgeny Bertinsky, eighteen hundred to eighteen forty-four. It is a little cup, but it is my own. Thus might Baratinsky sum up the small perfection of his art. He belonged to Pushkin's school, but was not eclipsed by the master. His oeuvre consisted of one slender volume of lyrics. These are marked by the originality of the discriminating eclectic, by a strong conscience for form, and by the obtruding intellection of a born pessimist. Like most of the Russian literateurs of the first half of the nineteenth century, with which he was born, Baratinsky belonged to the kept classes. An infringement of the Eighth Commandment, while he was at school, the Corps of Pages, reduced this son of a senator to a mere private. The experience may have accented his gloomy temperament. Aside from this, the outward circumstances of his life, including his marriage, were happy, and therefore have no history. His last years, however, were saddened by the consciousness of estrangement from the rising generation. Prayer King of heavens, release my sick soul to its peace, for the errors of earth send oblivion's dearth to thy stern paradise. Give my heart strength to rise. Alexei Koltsov, 1809-1842 Koltsov might be best described as a tame Burns. The adjective applies to the poetry more than to the poet, though even here we find a soberer man. He was a cattle dealer and the son of a cattle dealer, a cross between a trader and a cowpuncher, he spent his life in the sordid surroundings of his native town, with the exception of a few visits to the two capitals. There he met the literati of the day, dinnered with lairds, and was stared at in fashionable salons. He returned with a swollen head, which caused him a great deal of misery at home. The effect of his intercourse with the intellectuals was seen to be equally lamentable in his attempts at philosophic poetry. His last years were embittered by poverty, neglect, and a tragic love which ended in a lurid disease. His art maintained his umbilical connection with the people. He carries on the tradition of the Russian folk song, whether the stuff of his lyrics is the works and days of the peasant or themes of universal emotional appeal. He uses the free rhythms of the folk song. And, curiously enough, his favorite meter coincides with that of the Sophoclean choruses. Of his 124 poems, three-fourths have been set to music by some 100 Russian composers, among whom are Glinka and Rimsky-Korsakov. An Old Man's Song I shall saddle a horse, a swift courser he. I shall fly, I shall rush as the hawk is keen, over fields, over seas, to a distant land, I shall overtake there my youth again. I shall make myself spruce, be a blade again. I shall make a fine show for the girls again. But alas, no road leads to the past we've left, and the sun will not rise for us in the west. Mikhail Yermentov 1814-1841. Whether or not the semi-legendary Thomas of Erlsdun, who received his poetic gift from the fairies, was Lermontov's ancestor, it is certain that the Russian poet traced his lineage back to George Lermont of Scotland, who settled in Russia in the 17th century. His grandchildren claimed that they were descended from that Lermont who fought with Malcolm against Macbeth. Lermontov's immediate heredity was rather poor. His hysterical mother died in 1817 when he was three years old, and he grew up as the bone of contention between his father and his wealthy, overbearing grandmother. 
On her estate the spoiled darling received his early education of the usual imported type. He was extraordinarily precocious in both love and literature. Between 1828 and 1832 he had written 300 lyrics, 15 long narrative poems, and three dramas. He was little more than a boy when he graduated from a military college at St. Petersburg, having previously spent two years at the University of Moscow, and plunged into a life of poetry drowned in champagne. His technique as a heartbreaker was only excelled by his power as a poet, and that in spite of a repellent exterior. Upon Pushkin's death, Lermontov's obituary poem brought him rapid fame and exile in the Caucasus. This region was to the poets of Russia what Italy had been to those of England. The romantic glamour of the enchanted land suffused Lermontov's work. One of his flames called him a Prometheus chained to the rocks of the Caucasus, but he was more like a pendulum swinging between them and the beau monde of St. Petersburg. He indulged inordinately in the sadness of sarcasm, and was as well hated by the men as he was loved by the women. Spared by the bullets of the mountaineers, Lermontov was killed in a duel with an outraged colleague, only a year older at his death than was John Keats. Yet this brilliant bully and egotist rake was, after his own fashion, a knight of the Holy Grail and a poetic genius such as rarely graces any language. THE ANGEL Through the heavens of midnight an angel was sped who lifted his chant as he fled. The moon and the clouds and the stars leaned to hear the song rising holy and clear. He sang of the spirits, the sinless, the blessed, who softly in paradise rest. Of the gardens of God and of God was his song, ringing true as a heavenly gong. He bore a young soul to the dark gates of birth, toward the travailing sorrowful earth, and flying he sang, and the eager soul heard the deathless, the unuttered word. And the years in the world could but sadden and tire the soul filled with wondrous desire, and vainly the dull songs of earth would have stilled the song wherewith heaven had thrilled. THE CUP OF LIFE We drink life's cup with thirsty lips, our eyes shut fast to fears. About the golden rim there drips our staining blood, our tears. But when the last swift hour comes on, the light long hid is lit. From startled eyes the band is gone, we suffer and submit. It is not our part to possess the cup that golden gleamed, we see its shallow emptiness. We did not drink, we dreamed. Gratitude For all I thank thee, I, the meek remitter, For passion's secret torments without end, The kiss of venom, and the tears too bitter, The vengeful enemy, the slanderous friend, The spirit's ardor on the desert squandered, For every lash of life's deceiving thong, I thank thee for the wastes where I have wandered, but heed thou that I need not thank thee long. From the Demon, Part One, Fifteen. On the sightless sea of ether, rudderless without a sail, choirs of stars uplift their voices where the mist waves rise and fail. Through the hemless fields of heaven wander wide and tracelessly clouds unshepherded, unnumbered, pale, ephemeral, and free. Hour of parting, hour of meeting, neither gladden them nor fret. There's no yearning toward the future, there's no haunting of regret. On the grim day of disaster, these remember worlds away. Be beyond earth's reach as these are, and indifferent as they. CAPTIVE NIGHT Silent I sit by the prison's high window, Where through the bars the blue heavens are breaking, Flecks of the azure, the free birds are playing, Watching them fly there, my shamed heart is aching. 
but on my sinful lips never a prayer, never a song in the praise of my charmer. All I recall are far fights and old battles, my heavy sword and my old iron armor. Now in stone armor I helplessly languish, and a stone helmet my hot head encases. This shield is proof against arrows and sword-play, and without whip, without spur, my horse races. Time is my horse, the swift galloping charger, and for a visor this bleak prison grating. Walls of my prison are heavy stone armor, shielded by cast-iron doors I am waiting. Hurry, O oh fast-flying time, fly more quickly. In my new armor I faint, I am choking. I shall alight, with death holding my stirrup, then my cold face from this visor uncloaking. End of section two. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com.